AOSD. Watch me bring it out. A similar sound, doctor. AOSD. Watch me bring it out. You know this, you know this. So what they say, what they say. You brought her with you. Brought her with you. Now you're playing. Now you're playing. I ain't playing with your plans. Scriptures walk the land. I'm powering up a higher God like super science. Solo, kill a whole lot with three bulls from the Christians to the Hebrews. They're all lost like Nemo. When they give them a shot like a free throw, break it all down like a peephole. Just know from the lesson, and I didn't get the rest of the river in the kingdom that's a keyhole. Oh no, I know it's been fulfilled, and all know the kingdom is here. I'm like so. Underneath, we might die. Come learn with me, learn this new covenant living. The kingdom within, love with all of God's children. Watch me break some truth, brain works of good fruits. Hebrew literature, rip doctors like saber tooth. I'm gonna let it loose from the past over to the beast of boost from the law of Moses from head to toes. It's a new creation, everything is new. A-O-S-D, 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 a similar sound, not correct. Sorry that I'm running late. Uh, let's see if my clubhouse will go ahead and allow me to come on. Let's see here. Uh, it definitely will not. So let me uh, try to create something for my clubhouse in just a second. Uh, look at the YouTube uh, channel until I get everything straight. Show me one second. And that is definitely my fault. I should have been on a little bit earlier. Okay, there it allowed me to do it. So, uh, in five minutes, I will be getting on Clubhouse. So, sorry about that, everyone. But this is Evan Israel from the Similar Sound Doctrine. This is the YouTube channel, indeed. So, you can click on the channel in your search uh, bar, A O S D C H A N D L E R. Make sure you hit the bell, hit the like or the dislike, comment, and let me know why you did or did not. you did or did not uh, like the, the information presented. Sorry, y'all. I already have someone uh, asking me, where am I at? I thought you said 6 o'clock. What's going on, brother? So, uh, I definitely do apologize. So, now, uh, there's no more excuses. But, I can start now. Also, in the search, make sure you look at RPK-Resurrection Prophecy and Kingdom where we concentrate on those three tenets, bringing out the biblical information so you guys can understand it. Also, you can look at SF Wisdom. SF Wisdom, Snake Fighting Wisdom. It's, it's meaning behind it. Uh, you got to ask the, the creator of the content what it's about, but there's definitely meaning indeed behind it. Uh, also, our mentor, Mr. William Bell, or Dr. William Bell, All Things Fulfilled, uh, you can actually go to his channel too, where he has over 600 videos, I believe, breaking breaking down a plethora of scriptures. So the point of this channel is to ch give people the Hebraic understanding, the ancient Hebraic understanding, before it got twisted and modernized. Right? We're trying to uh, break down some of the idioms and metaphors and all type of literary devices that was used in the ancient times, so we can actually get a better flow with the scriptures. So the things that we present is not uh, your everyday 
doctrine. It's not something that you're going to hear every day. It's going to be something new. Is it some people they like it? Some people hate it because, like I said, it's not uh, your 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 everyday scripture uh, uh, from from the be- the breakdowns that you hear. It's not westernized, you know. We can actually put it for people in the western world to actually hear, uh, most definitely. But at the same time, at the same time, we try to keep it as close to the Eastern understanding as possible. So we have received a watered down doctrine and with the watered down doctrine we have, uh, people have plenty of different things they can actually do. It's it's plenty of leeway that they have uh, with this uh, Bible, this doctrine, creating uh, all of these different organizations trying to explain what scriptures really mean. So, I know people are like, dang, he's talking. Uh, give me two minutes when I get up on the clubhouse, and then I actually start the lesson. But today, we're going to be revealing the Antichrist, the revelation of the Antichrist. Because for some reason, when people talk about the Antichrist, they make it be about what's going on in the 21st century, Sometimes they tell you that the Antichrist is actually a, a system, a religious system. Sometimes they make it be another inanimate object like um, the chip or the computers or the president and etc. you know. But coming from the historical point of view, from when the scriptures was created, we take it being created before 70 AD, but even, I'm going to demonstrate today, it doesn't even matter if it was created after 70 AD. It don't matter if it was created in the 90s under uh, Emperor Domitian. It doesn't matter. Uh, once we get done, you're going to see how that can fit the bill too. But we're taking it to be created before the destruction of the uh, Jerusalem by the evidence inside of Revelation, but we know apocalyptic literature, very symbolic, and just like a lot of the scriptures, uh, especially dealing with the New Testament and etc., some of the things was written after the events, that doesn't mean that it wasn't Holy Spirit inspired, it just, that's the time that they wrote it, it could have been received before, and then finally got transcribed when it was, when it was time. Uh, by the Most High, so I'm not going to say, I'm not going to get into all of the dates, because to me that doesn't matter, once we see who the Antichrist is, who the Bible, historical Hebrews, who they alluded to the Antichrist being, then by default we will see how all prophecies had been fulfilled of first century, so now it is time I can actually enter into a clubhouse now, I believe. Let's see here. I am now. Might as well have this. Let's see here. There we go. I am in the room. Let me unmute myself. Okay. So, everyone, I am in clubhouse now. So, if you want to be part of it, please do. How do you add people? (laughs) This is something new that's going on in Clubhouse. Uh, Let's see, Christianity. I got you there. Be Hebrew. Let's get you there. Invited you up, my brother. There we go. Make your mod. Shalom, brother. Uh, Josephus, hope you're having a fantastic day. I have no idea how to invite people no more. Hold on, let me cut it down. All right, there we go. Come on up, brother Mike. 
Oh, sorry. I'm about to speak. There we go. Shalom, brother. Uh, I'm trying to, I know the chat is here. I don't, do y'all see how to invite people now? Or you can't invite people no more? Yeah, okay, I see it. Invite people. Okay, I got it. I got it. I found it. It's hidden. Okay, okay. How's everyone doing? It's all good. It's all good, brother. All you gotta do is talk to it. It'll leave. That's awesome. Let's see here. Uh, well, I'm gonna uh, once I hit the, the the red, and I can't invite nobody anymore, I'm gonna actually take off. But man, it's been about two weeks since we've been on. You know, I had a, I had a change in my schedule. Uh, my brother was under the weather, so. Uh, you know, we had a little bit of time that we took off, but you better believe now uh, we're going to come with some fire. Today we're going to be revealing the biblical Antichrist. Now, not the Antichrist that people created in the 21st century. Uh, we're not going to take that perspective. We're going to try to go to the biblical Antichrist. So what we're going to go through, we're going to use the Bible. And we're going to dissect the book of Revelation and so forth and so on. So, I'm going to get ready to get started now. The first place we're going to start would be Revelation 13. Revelation 13, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. The Bible states, and if y'all could, uh, please ping people inside of the, the room and etc. So, uh, but this is what the Bible states. And what we're going to do, we're going to rule, we're going to read it, we're going to let the Bible speak for itself. So hopefully everyone has a Bible open in front of them. If you're not on uh, YouTube or Facebook, have a Bible open in front of you. That's the only way that it works. It's the only way that it makes sense. So now, Revelation 13 and 1. And I stood upon the sand. Hold on. Let me read my brother. Okay. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horn. Ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So now, once, once you're dealing with the book of Revelation, we've got to understand a lot of these things are symbolic. It's apocalyptic literature. I know people want to go. It's a vision also. So I know people want to go in there and extrapolate all this information and try to make it as westernized and as English as possible. And they get lost in the symbolism because there's so much trying to be historical buffs that they kind of miss what's going on. So we're going to try to show what's going on here. I know that there's ten horns. I know that there's uh, uh, ten crowns. I know that there's seven heads. I know that we have an element sort of like a leopard, a bear, and a, a, a lion introduced. But the point of it is, it's one beast, one beast that has a lot of attributes going on with it. So one beast with a lot of attributes. And then we have a dragon that gave power, authority, and seat to this beast. So, the first thing we got to understand is 
the Bible teaches us that it is the Most High that gives power to individuals. But in this scenario in Revelation, it's not the Most High that was said to give power to the beast. It was the dragon who gave power to the beast. So that's one thing. It's, it's making an illusion that this beast right here is said to have his power given to him by a new means compared to the old means, which was the most high given the authority, the power, and the seed, and etc. So that's the first thing to understand. It's we got we got a difference here. All right, so let's continue. We're going to go through. A little bit of prophecy to see where John the Revelator was piggybacking off of. So, first thing first, what was said to be given unto this beast? Power was given unto the beast. So, understand the elements of the beast. The beast was like a leopard, it had feet like a bear, and mouth like a lion. So, inside of the beast, it had three elements, leopard, bear, lion. So the people in the church would have understood this because they would have studied Torah and the Tanakh. So the first thing was given was power. So we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7. This is, be, this is be coming out of the Greek version of it. Chapter 7, verse 6. Look what it says. And this one I looked, and behold, another wild beast as a leopard. So we heard the leopard in the book of Revelation chapter 13. Now we have the leopard presented in Daniel. So Daniel got it first, John the Revelator got it second. So now, and behold, another wild beast as a leopard. Now notice how he described it. And it had four wings of a bird upon it. And the wild beast had four heads. And power was given to it. Now what was said given in the book of Revelation? Power was given to this beast that had an attribute of a leopard. Now in Daniel 7, power is given to this beast that has the attribute of a leopard. But we find out in the book of Revelation that this power actually came from the dragon. So, if the power came from the dragon in the book of Revelation, then Daniel's the same beast that got the same power, it's alluding that power was given to this beast also by means of this dragon. Now, this, all this is going to make sense in a second. Second of all, in Revelation 13, it said that this beast that John the Revelator saw that had the feet of a bear, it was given a seat. Well, once you go to Daniel 7 and 5, let's read it. It says, And behold, a second beast like a bear. So we got the same elements once again in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 and 5. And behold, a second beast like a bear, and it supported itself on one side. And there were three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise devour much flesh. So now, first of all, you got to understand the description that's given here. If, if you don't focus on these words, on these descriptive words, you will overlook what was, say, what was said. So now, a bear, if anyone knows how a bear operates, it walks on all fours. But when it's time to display aggression or dominance or etc., 
it stands up on its two hind legs. So the first thing in Daniel 7, 5 was the bear supported itself on one side. So it's two sides of a bear. You got the front half and you got the bottom half. The two quote unquote arms and then two legs. So it's supporting itself on one side means the bear is in an upright position. So you got to ask yourself a question. Is the bear standing in an upright position or is the bear sitting in an upright position? Well, once you read Daniel 7, 5, notice it supported itself on one side. And then there was three ribs in its mouth. And the three ribs said, arise, devour much flesh. So if the bear was, our, when the bear supported itself on one side, if it was already standing up, why would the ribs in its mouth tell it to stand up more? How can you stand up more than standing up? So, by default, the way that it's written is the bear was in a seated position and the ribs in his mouth told it to stand up. Arise, devour much flesh. Stand up, devour much flesh. So, what's the point of this? If a bear is sitting down, it's in a seated position. In Revelation 13, the seat was given unto the beast. So how the power was given unto the beast, we find out that the power, sorry, as the power was given unto the leopard part of the beast, we find out that power was given to the leopard part in Daniel 7. And as the seat was given to the beast, we find out that the bear is in a seated position. So now, what was the last thing that was given? Authority. Authority also was given unto this beast. So once you go to Daniel 7, we're going to read verses 4. The first was as a lioness, and her wings as an eagle's. I beheld until her wings were plucked. And she was lifted off from the earth. And she stood on human feet. And a man's heart was given to her. So this is pretty much a transformation from an animal into a person. Animal characteristic into a characteristics of a person. But th that's not the point of today. So we're going to find out who this lion was. So remember, we're looking at authority now. We found out about power in Revelation 13. We found out about the, the seat in Revelation 13. So now let's find out about the authority. So once you go to Daniel chapter 2, verse number, let's go to verse 31. 31 says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, an image. Think about that first. An image, because all of this stuff is going to come together, what's actually happening in the book of Revelation. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, an image. That image was great, and the appearance of it excellent, standing before thy face, and the form of it was terrible. So then we're going to skip down to verse 36 now. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. That's the title that's only for the Messiah. But thou, O king, art a king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given a powerful and strong and honorable kingdom. Who gave it? Who gave it to him? The God of heaven. What's going on in the book of Revelation? The dragon is doing it. But let's keep reading. Verse 38. In every place 
where the children of men dwell, and he has given unto thine hand the wild beast of the field, and the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea, and he has made thee Lord of all. Thou art the head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and a third kingdom, which is the brass, which shall have dominion over all the earth. But notice what did Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the lion, what did he have? He had dominion over the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea. He was made Lord over all. But once you go into Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, listen to what it says. For, uh, and God said, let us make man according to our image and likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the flying creatures of heaven, and over the cattle, and all the earth, and over all the reptiles, and that them that creep on the earth. And God made man according to the image of God. So now I'm going to go down to verse 28. And God blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the seas, flying creatures of heaven, and all the cattle of the earth, and the reptiles that creep on the earth. So this is mankind receiving authority and dominion. Dominion and authority. Authority was given to this lion creature in the book of, uh, sorry, this lion attribute in Revelation 13, just like this authority was given unto King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. So, one thing, and then once you keep reading Daniel, you find out that Nebuchadnezzar actually thought that he was the one that gave himself the dominion and authority. Then he had to walk around eating grass and stuff. But he, at that point in time, he stopped looking at the God of heaven and he pointed inwardly and said, I am the reason I have this kingdom. So he said, I am the reason I have this authority. So once you go into Revelation 13, what are you looking at? That will be the question. First of all, what are, you, what are you looking at? You're looking at a beast that has the attributes of every kingdom listed in Daniel chapter 7. This beast has the attribute of Babylon. It has the attribute of the Medo-Persians. It has the attributes of the Grecians. So this one beast has all of these attributes. So now I want to make a another observation. Once you go to Daniel chapter 7, verse number 7, look what it says about this fourth beast. It says, After this one I looked, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and exceedingly strong, and its teeth were, were of iron devouring and crushing to atoms and it trampled the remainder with its feet and it was altogether different from the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns but what did it do it trampled the remainder with its feet so we're looking for a beast that does some trampling, some trotting down. It does a lot of trotting. It trots down the beast that were before it, and it trots down as we keep going on in Daniel. We find out that not only do it try down the beast that were before it, it also tried down the saints. So this is how you understand the New Testament. This is the Greek version of it. This is They would have been looking at the Greek version, the Aramaic version, and they would have also been looking at, um, um, what's the, what's, what's I'm looking for? 
the Targums. They've been looking at the Targum versions also. So when we go, when you, when you, when you go into the New Testament and you look at some words about Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles and Jerusalem being trampled, understand in Daniel 7, there's only one beast that's doing some trampling. That would be the fourth beast. So if Christ stated that in his generation some things were going to get trodden down and trampled, Christ is talking about something that fourth beast was going to do, which we know the fourth beast is dealing with Rome. But we're going to get more specific because people kind of don't go into the book of Revelation and let the book of Revelation explain what it means so if the book of revelation is an expansion on the book of daniel that means that the book of revelation can be looked at can be as a decoder ring for what daniel was saying in his prophecy because if you recall daniel did not understand daniel knew what horns were he knew what this stuff was that's why he wrote it down when the angels told him horns, he did not have to, hey, what's, what's all these horns stuff? They knew that horns represented people in authority and, and et cetera. They knew that the host of heaven represented people in authority. So they, they knew this already. So Daniel needed to understand about all of these horns on this one specific beast. What's going on with this? So when we get to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation actually explains what this seventh beast, I mean, sorry, seven, what this fourth beast is all about in Daniel 7. So once we go to Revelation 17, and after this, I'll open the floor and see if anybody wants to say anything before I continue on. So once we go to Revelation 17, we're going to read verses 8 through 11 about this beast, the beast with the ten horns. Let's read about the description that John the Revelator gave. So now, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend. So the, first of all, think about that. The beast that, thou, that, they, that you saw was, is not, and shall ascend. Now, where do we get some of that language from? Now, I believe if we go to, I might be wrong, but if we go to Revelation chapter 1, and let's see, verse number 18. For I am he that liveth. No, that's not it. That's not it. Let's see here. The things that thou saw. Uh, hereafter. What is it that says, I am here that was, was not? Let's see here. It's not 11, because 11 says Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It's a verse in Revelation that describes Christ. It says, He was, um, which are. I'm not going to find it right now. If you guys know what I'm saying, just, uh, just say it out loud, and then uh, I'll I go to it. But uh, it was describing Christ. That might be it. Uh, verse 18, ain't it? I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So, yeah. He that liveth was and was dead, and behold, I am alive nevermore. It says something like, which will, in fact, hold on. I think it's in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, let's see here. And I don't want to hold up the lesson for it, but it's, it's a great comparison how Christ described himself. Verse 8, let's see here. The first, the last, which was dead and is alive. Oh, hold on here. Hold on here. Here we go. It was Revelation 1. Verse number 4. 
John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. These are elements. These are characteristics of the Messiah. Which is, which was, which is to come. That's how them are descriptive words of the Messiah. So once you go into Revelation 17 now, verse number 8, listen to how the beast is described. The beast that thou saw was, was, is not, and shall be, or shall ascend. So these are the same descriptors, pretty much, as Christ. So this beast is promoting himself as a false messiah. So now, let's read it. The beast that thou saw was, was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. Now, understand, this is the beast that has the ten, uh, the seven heads, ten crowns, ten horns, right? And they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose name were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So now, let's let John the Revelator explain more about the beast. So this is more descriptive terms about the beast. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Now, for anybody out there, they'll be like, hey, this was for somebody that had some type of earthly knowledge or people that were scientists or people that understood how numerology worked in the Old uh, Testament or the, or the Greek Empire. No. When he says wisdom here, he's talking about that heavenly wisdom. He's talking about that wisdom that you get from the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about your average, everyday person who went to academy. That's not what he's talking about. So now, and here is the mind, the heart of those which have the Holy Spirit. Now, let me explain to you guys. That's what he's saying. You guys that have the Holy Spirit, because we know the Holy Spirit, Christ said, teaches all things to everybody. So the people who had the Holy Spirit would have understood this. So he says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. So now, the seven heads represents the seven mountains. The seven, let me read it again. And here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sit. And there are seven kings. So the seven heads are not the seven kings. Let me say it again. Just because we see the number seven there. Just because the number seven is there, and that kind of trips people up. But just because the number seven is there, that doesn't mean a hill of beans. That's not what, it, the seven heads are seven mountains. But he's going to give you a little bit more understanding. And there are seven kings. So just in case you didn't understand the seven mountains, I'm going to give you a little bit more information. There are seven kings. Five are falling. So now we got it. They can go through history. And one is, so this is the beast, right? Which is, which was, hold on, which was, is not, and shall come. The five are falling. That's the was part of the beast. Let me read it again. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and yet is. So now, five are falling. That's the was part of the beast. And one is. And another is not. So there's the was, one is, that's the yet is, and another is not yet come. 
and that is the is not. So in other words, in verse 8, when he said, the beast that was is not and yet is, this is what he's talking about, kings. He's talking about kings. So now, the beast, which was, is not, and yet is to come, when he cometh, he shall continue a short space. And now, listen to verse number 11. Uh, thanks, somebody want to come up. Uh, you can raise your hand. I'm going to open it up when I get done with this. Then I'll let the people or uh, whoever got to talk, talk. And then I'll come back with some more points. That's how we uh, do it here. So now, this is verse number 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. The eighth what? The eighth king. And is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So verse number 11, Revelation 7, 11. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth king. So the beast is a king that came after a succession of kings. This, this beast have all of these attributes, is part of this king lineage. He's in relation to this king lineage in one way or another. So the beast himself with the seven with the seven heads, the ten crowns, the ten horns, the beast itself, all of that stuff don't matter because that beast is one, one king. So this woman was riding on one king. So before we go in there and try to figure out what's all these horns and all that other stuff, understand we're talking about one king that's over the seven mountains, whose, whose kingdom is of the seven mountains, and that one beast, that one king, came in succession of the seven kings before it. And he is of the seven, meaning he has a lineage dealing with those seven one ways or another. So the beast is one king. So the beast in Revelation, the beast in Daniel, is talking about one specific king. So now, I will open up the floor if anybody want to say anything, and then we'll continue when uh, we're done uh, with the conversation. Uh, as we as we look at who those kings was, 
Okay. Um, when you said that you wanted to go into the historical, uh, uh, and it's historical, the history of which of those five kings which have fallen, and the one that is, we know that's the Roman Empire. I think we could uh, assume that John, where it says one is, that would be the Roman Empire in, in his time. That would be number six. And it shall be a seven, but the eight shall be of the seven. So, uh, yeah, so if we look at the five which was fallen, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe it's the Babylonian, the Egyptian, uh, the Assyrian, or the Medo Persians, I think I think those uh, those empires or those kings have fallen. I think that's five right there, and number six will be Rome. And uh, uh, who's number seven? You know, I think I think that's that's a very good question because we know that the eighth shall be of the seven. You know, so I think that you know. If we figure out who's at number seven, and we can understand who would be the final beast as we narrow down towards the end. Now, my understanding, my calculation, number seven was the Ottoman Empire, the, the Islamic Empire. Um, they went on a conquest to conquer lots of lots of uh, land and over in the east, in the Middle East. Uh, this is why you have. Islam blanketed, just blanketed the entire region. I think uh, there's historical uh, information that the Ottoman Empire have actually conquered uh, Rome, at least parts of Rome of, of that nature. And so, if the seven, if the eight shall be, now look, many, in many Christian circles, uh, they have that the Roman Empire will be revived. The Roman Empire will but when we check the lineup, Rome was number six. You know, uh, it's whoever, whoever was number seven, that's the one that shall be revived because that eight shall be of the seven. So whoever's number seven, I believe it's the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Uh, that's what the eighth and final beast would be. Okay, it is the Islamic regime. Okay, and the Antichrist just make it behind. Like, and, um, and so as we look at like what's happening here in the world right now, okay, we have the European powers. These, these, this, this is heating up, guys. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is heating up. Okay, so if the uh, European powers get out of the way, not all of them, but a large, again, if we, we don't know for sure, we, we're, we're watching, watching it print. But if the European powers just like they go at each other, then there is. A lot of it is Islamic empires, which pretty much just when the outside looking in, okay, they will be lined up to be, okay, your next powers. You know, so when the Antichrist come, he just made to get behind those Muslims, and and uh, is that a final beast could be really, you know, one one to be reckoned with. But we know the Lord Jesus. You know, we we know that He comes at the end and destroys everything. So yeah, actually. Excellent information, uh, great bill, and I'm just here to add on, you know. So uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, thank you, my brother. And um, uh, as as you listen on, I, I think you're gonna uh, see where we're where we're heading with this. But um, as the historical scriptorial breakdown. And then, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna continue. And then at the next uh, time, you know, I, I do two or three pauses for people to come in and, and everybody say, uh, you know, how they feel about it, etc. But at the historical aspect of what we just read, uh, this eighth king is an actual king, uh, not a kingdom. The the Greeks. The Babylonians, the Medo Persians, they got included in the attributes of this king. Now, you might not have been in the room when I went over Revelation 13, but uh, in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, Daniel 7, and etc., 
of all of those kingdoms got included in the attribute of this beast. So this beast would be one king and not kingdom. And I know that we kind of have a, a, a tendency in the Western world, the modern world, to look at things that's similar in our time period and try to make it kind of fit scripture. But to, to us, that's not really the route. We try to leave it in the historical setting first and see what the Holy Spirit is saying, and then we apply it. So uh, what, what I want to do now, and if does anyone want to add anything else before I, I go on to Revelation, uh, keep going to Revelation 13 to uh, clear this up a little, whole lot more? And I appreciate that, my brother. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, when dealing with Revelation, right, we recall that Christ made a statement uh, when he was talking to the woman, the woman at Samaria. And she was asking him, you know, where are we going to worship at? You know, I will, you know, your father, Jew, said that we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. You know, our father of the Samaritans say that we can worship here in Mount Gerizim. So, you know, what do you say we're supposed to worship it? And Christ made a, 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 a statement, a bold statement. He said, the time is coming and now is where the true worshipers, they're not going to worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, but the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father seeks such individuals to worship him. So once you go into Revelation chapter 1, right? Revelation 1, verse 4, it stated that from the seven spirits, which are before the throne, right? And then in Revelation 1, we also see that, let me find it here, verse 10. I'm going to start at 9 and read 10. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So John, even though he was going through tribulation, he said he was in the kingdom, right? And he had the in and in the patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos. Patmos is not in Mount Gerizim. It's not in Jerusalem. Notice Christ said, "Those that worship Him will worship Him in spirit and in truth." Verse nine was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So John the Revelator was in spirit. Christ said those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. So the things we have to understand, the book of Revelation is a book that people in the spirit would understand. Not a scholar, uh, not someone who was well-versed in, in the Tanakh or the Torah, not someone who went to a university, not a scribe or a Pharisee or a Sadducee or an Essene or a fake Christian, but in the first century, those that were in spirit. That's why he's saying those that have wisdom, where the wisdom come from the spirit, would understand these things. 
Listen, though, those who have an ear, those that will hear with their spirit, because the spirit does the teaching, they will understand this. So John being in the spirit, talking to other people that have the spirit, is conversing about the spiritual things they were experiencing in the first century, and he was expounding on it through symbolism, through apocalyptic literature. The only way that you could understand the apocalyptic literature, the only way you could understand the symbols was you had to have the Holy Spirit. And this is why a lot of people don't understand what's going on with the book of Revelation. And I'm not saying here, hey, I got the Holy Spirit. I can hear all this stuff. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that this is a spiritual book that you have to be in the spirit to comprehend. So when other people see dragons, that's the symbol. You got to know the point behind it. What is the spirit telling you the interpretation behind it? When people see hills, mountains, beasts, what is actually being stated here? And, and just a little historical information, and then we're going to continue. Understand, people, remember, in the first century, this is the start of pretty much the church, the church under Christ, the way that when Christ the Messiah came down, this is his starting, the origin of his place. Uh, according to the book of Revelation, he was going to use the menorah as the churches that's found through the, Ro the, the Roman providence. He didn't use uh, the land of Canaan. He didn't use uh, uh, anything that was going on in Egypt. He did not, according to the book of Revelation, those wasn't the starting place of where he wanted his actual church to be at. It was the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, we know it started in Jerusalem. We know it started in Jerusalem. But when he put his marker down, we have here that he's using the that of the Roman providence in order to further or to expound and actually set this menorah inside of his temple. Because that's what the seven churches represented. The menorah. The menorah is inside of the temple. So, And what does the menorah do? It's, it lightens up the temple. So this church would be the light of his temple. But anyway, you know, I don't want to go into all of that. So let's, do, let's, let's look at it deeper. That's all I want everybody to understand. We know the historical aspect of it. The church, people are being martyred. People are being going through martyrdom. People are being killed for believing on Christ. It didn't matter if you were a Jew, a northern kingdom, or a Gentile. At this point in time, people were being killed for Christ. Understand, the book of Revelation was penned. John received the revelation during the tribulation period, during the time that people were being slaughtered for their faith on Christ. So, you better believe the book of Revelation has people being slaughtered in the first century for their belief on Christ. Not only does it have that, it has the people that was in charge of slaughtering them for belief on Christ. And this is hid in symbolism. It's hid in these objects. So now, let's, let's go. Revelation 13. So we got the whole background of what's happening while Revelation was penned. So Revelation 13 and 4. So this is what's happening here. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So we have the dragon giving power unto the beast. And they worship the beast. Now we know that this beast is one king. And they worship the beast, this one king, saying, who is like unto this king, this beast, who is able to make war with him? 
the people that's worshiping the king is saying this. Now, what do we call that? That's idolatry. That's man worship. They're worshiping the beast it's the the worship the worship they're supposed to be giving to Christ. They're actually giving it to the beast, and the beast got his power from the dragon. So first, we have to understand who the dragon is, because once again, all of these things have a spiritual revelation of what's going on, and people then made it carnal. If you had to have the Holy Spirit in order to worship the Father. Why don't we think you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to understand things written by the Holy Spirit? If a person can come in and read, if an atheist, an atheist can come in and read the same book that you read and get the same understanding that you get, then obviously your understanding is off because the Holy Spirit wrote this and anyone outside of the Holy Spirit cannot understand it. So now, here's another spiritual thing we're going to go through. Who is this beast and how did this beast or this, sorry, who is this dragon and how did this dragon get so much power? So first of all, let's look at the dragon. Revelation 12 and 9. And the great dragon was cast out. So we got a casting out of the dragon let's it, it goes revelation tells you who it is that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the first thing first, dealing with this dragon that had this power, understand with the dragon what all of this power was doing, deceiving the whole world. And he was called the old serpent. Some people refer to him as the devil or a devil. Some of them refer to him as a Satan or an adversary. He was going around deceiving the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth. But where is this going from? What is this talking about? Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Who would know that, that John, the revelator, would go back to Moses to explain what's going on with this dragon. Because if you don't know the backstory, you might get off in the understanding of what this dragon having power and what this dragon giving power to the beast, what it all means. So we're going to find out what it means. So Genesis 3 and 1, I'm going to read this out of the KJV. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Let's go to verse number four and five now. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Was her eyes already open? Was she walking around with her eyes closed, talking to the serpent? Was her eyes in her forehead? Were they closed and she was walking around like a blind woman? No. So the eyes that the serpent is talking about here is not your fleshly eyes. He wasn't offering them something flesh. He wasn't offering them a, a fleshly something, a fleshly appearance. He was offering them something inwardly, something more spiritual. He was opening something in their hearts 
that they did not have open at first. Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he was going to give them, opening their eyes, they was going to receive a type of knowledge that the Most High did not present them with at first. And if you think this off, once you go to verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. So, this right here in Genesis 3, what this serpent was offering was a particular type of wisdom that went against the wisdom that the Most High was offering. So now, once you go down to verse 13 through 15, and the Lord said, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Now, does it seem like the Lord is giving the dragon, the old serpent, any power here? Does it sound like the Lord bestowed authority upon the serpent? Let's keep reading. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. That's that adversary right there. That's that Satan right there. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And as you go down farther, verse 23, Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground. Verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims. If people don't know what the garden of Eden was, the garden of Eden represented a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly place, not an earthly place. So he drove man from a heavenly wisdom and let man have an earthly wisdom. So now, was Satan, was the devil here driven out of heavenly Jerusalem? Was the Satan, was the adversary, was the devil, was the dragon here in Genesis chapter 3, was he driven out of the Garden of Eden. No, he was not. Only men was cast out of the Garden of Eden. And only man left the heavenly state. So when you go into the book of Revelation, what do we read? Finally, that old serpent, the dragon, was cast out of heaven and to and went unto the earth. So now, according to the book of Revelation, finally, Satan was cast out of the Garden of Eden. He wasn't cast out of the Garden of Eden until the times of Revelation. So, this is why Christ can see Satan falling down from heaven like lightning. This is why uh, in the book, of, of Zechariah, I believe, when they have in the heavenly uh, uh, council, you have Satan up there with, with Joshua and etc. So you have Satan being able to be inside of the heavenly uh, abode. He wasn't cast out until the book of Revelation. So, even though he was in the heavenly region, even though he was there, did it sound like the Lord give, gave him any power? No. The Lord did not give Satan any power. So how was the dragon able to have power and give it to another if the Lord didn't give him power? Where did he get the power from? Well, now, let's go to James. Let's let the Bible explain 
what's going on because I know we have been taught in the Western world in the modern day world to take things written by the Holy Spirit as literal as possible and try to make everything as carnal as possible instead of getting the actual meaning, the spiritual meaning behind it. So James is going to actually explain what Moses was saying, what happened inside of the Garden of Eden. So once you go to James chapter 1, let's go here. James 1. We're going to read 13 through 15. Check this out. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Verse 14. But every man is tempted. So this included Christ. Do y'all remember what happened when Christ received the Holy Spirit? What did he go through? He went through temptation of the devil. When Adam in Genesis chapter 2, when the breath of life was breathed into Adam, when Adam received that Holy Spirit, what did Adam and his counterpart go through? Temptation from the devil. So when a person receives heavenly wisdom, the first thing they do, they go through temptation because they have to fight between heavenly stuff and earthly stuff. So now James is going to explain it. But every man is tempted. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived. This is uh, uh, like um, consummation language. You know, when a man and woman lie together, uh, she becomes pregnant. So when lust hath conceived and bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, what happened in the Garden of Eden? James is actually explaining what happened in the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden was mankind was given over unto their own earthly lust and when they was given over into their own earthly lust they got cast out of the presence of the most high and when they got cast out of the presence of the most high for that sin what happens when sin is finished it bringeth forth death what happened when when the word told adam if you eat of this tree what did he say was going to happen you will surely die. The day that you eat of this tree, you will surely die. The day they ate of the tree, what happened? They got cast out of heaven. They got cast out of the, the presence of the tree of life and the Father. So what did, James, what did James say? James, a Jew who knew this stuff, what did he say? He saw the story that Moses gave and how did he explain it for the layman man when he received the Holy Spirit? He said, when a person is tempted, there's not a snake there tempting nobody, okay? There's not a dragon there tempting nobody. There's not a worm there tempting nobody or whatever people want to use with all the superstition because they don't listen to the spirit talk. It's not a real Satan there tempting people. When people are tempted, he's drawn away in his own lust and enticed, just like what Nebuchadnezzar did. When Nebuchadnezzar, when he found out that the Lord of heaven gave him all of the kingdom. But then what did he do? He got drawn away in his own lust. And he starts saying, I did this stuff. It was me. And what happened? He was cursed until he repented. Or until that time period came when it was time for him to repent. So here we have it here. When a man is drawn away in his own lust. Then it 
bottles up in him and bring forth sin, and sin bringeth forth death. So that Satan character in Genesis represented the lust of man, and when that lust of man conceived, it brought forth sin. And when that sin was finished, it brought forth death. So how did Satan, this Satan character, get its power? It got its power when people start looking inwardly at their own self. They was given over to their own lust. They were being evil continuously as what happened in Genesis chapter 6. They were always been evil. They always had self this, self that, and this is how they got power through lust, through uh, thievery, through uh, killings and all of this stuff, man worship and all of this stuff. All of these things, just dealing with self, dealing with wickedness, this is what gave Satan power. So when a person is full of wickedness and people back their wickedness then it's like a person is receiving power dominion from satan it's equivalent you getting a uh, evil person being backed by more evil people is equivalent to satan having power and what did Christ come to do? He come to destroy the works of Satan. How did Christ come to destroy the works of Satan? Through one word, love. So if Satan's work is opposite of love, this is what's going on in the Bible. Something opposite of love, and Christ is trying to bring that love back. So when you go into the book of Revelation, you have this king who obviously is arrogant, obviously has vain glory, Obviously, it's on given over to his own lust. Obviously, ain't worrying nothing about God. He is receiving power from his own surrounding, his own people, his own comrades, his own mind. He's me, me, me. So now, let's see if we can see what I'm stating. And then uh, I'm going to open it back up, and then uh, I will continue. So, once you go into Revelation 13, 5 and 7, 5 through 7, let's see, all right, so the dragon gave power unto the beast. So this, this mindset of wickedness allowed this king to continue in his wickedness and gain more and more power. Let's see here. Revelations 13, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So when he was speaking these great things, and when he was blaspheming, let's find out what happened. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So while he's speaking these great things and while he's blaspheming, he's getting more power. He's getting more support. So let's find out. Remember, we find out that your own personal lust, your own wickedness, that's the Satan. That's the, the quote unquote, you getting power from Satan thing. So let's find out what's happening when he started blaspheming and speaking great things and getting this power. Verse number six, he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So now, what, this is the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. When the snake was in the Garden of Eden, quote unquote serpent, quote unquote serpent, uh, I mean, sorry, a dragon, Komodo dragon, whatever you want it to be, when it was inside of the Garden of Eden, what was it doing? It was telling mankind uh, what the Lord told you, that's not real. The Lord's trying to trick you because uh, he's, he's want, he wants to hide things from you. Uh, don't believe him. 
go your way. Do this right here. Do opposite of what he tells you, and then you will become as him. So now, this is the same thing as, this is equivalent to this beast blaspheming against God. This is equivalent to him speaking against all that dwell in heaven because that heaven would represent the Garden of Eden. So verse number seven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So look at the authority that he's getting now. Now he has his own lust. Now he's me, me, me. He's, he has his own power. He feels that he's the reason why he has his kingdom. So now, what did he do first? He attacked anything that deals with God. Anything that says you don't have your own power. The power that you have has been, has been bestowed on you by the God of heaven. So now, Anything spoken like that, he's against. So who is he making war with? against? Only people that's dealing with righteousness. Only people that's trying to follow God. So he blasphemed God. He made war against the saints. And he's, over, he's able for a time to overcome them. And as he's doing that, he's getting more and more power. He's being more and more wicked. He's thinking that he's more and more godlike. So let's 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 let me show you. Once we go to Daniel chapter seven, because Revelation thirteen is actually Daniel seven. So once we go to Daniel seven, verse number, we're gonna read this out of the Greek uh, version. Daniel seven, verse twenty and twenty one. Listen to what it says. And concerning its ten horns that were in his head. And the other that came up and rooted up some of the former, which had eyes and a mouth speaking great things. And his look was bolder than the rest. I beheld, and that horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So what's happening in Revelation chapter 13? This is what's going on under the fourth beast in Daniel 7, 20 and 21. So this horn, which we find out later, is actually the beast. So that one horn is actually the beast of Revelation. Once again, this one horn is actually the beast. I know we get caught up in the beast horn Ten horns, three horns, seven horns. We get caught up in all that numerology, not knowing that those numbers actually represented something to the Jews. It kind of represented something uh, symbolic like perfection or completion or uh, and stuff like that. It didn't really, they wasn't really saying count one, two, three, four, five. That's eight people right there. That's not, that's not really what they were doing. That's not how they operated. But anyway, let's go to verse 24 through 26. And his ten horns are ten kings that shall arise. Don't get don't get lost in the numbers. And after them shall arise another who shall exceed all the former ones in wickedness, and he shall subdue three kings. Listen to all of the numbers that they use. The number 10 meant something to them. The number 3 meant something to them. Why not why not 4? Why not five? Because these numbers actually meant things to them. But anyway, verse 25. And he shall speak words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And shall think to change times and laws. And power shall be given unto his hand for a time and times and half a time. So now... Let's go through, let's go to another section where this is explained more. Daniel 11, 36 through 39. And he shall do according to his will. So now it's going to explain more. 
and the king. Don't you like how we how say these words right here? And the king shall exalt and magnify himself against every god. So what is he saying? He's greater than every god. And shall speak great swelling words. And shall prosper until the indignation shall be accomplished. For it is coming to an end. And he shall not regard any gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Neither shall he regard any deity, for he shall magnify himself above all. So we see how he has given over into his own lust. Now he is saying that he himself is God, he himself is king. Nobody has given him nothing. He has earned every single thing that has came to him. He will fight for power. He will kill. He will destroy. He will do all of those things. This is what that king did. He didn't care about his ancestry. He didn't care about anything that his fathers worshipped. He didn't care for, he didn't desire women. Now, what, what is all of this is coming from? He didn't, him not regarding any gods, uh, desiring any women, no deities. This should take you back into the Garden of Eden once again. Let us, deities, let us make man in our image. It is not good for man to be alone. Um, the man is good for the man to marry and all of that stuff. So all of those things that's good for a man not to be alone. It's good for a man to have a woman. Uh-uh, not this guy. He don't desire women. So whatever the Lord put up for that, he don't want that. Uh, let us be. Let us make man in our image. He don't regard any deity. I don't, I'm not in the image of none of those guys. I, that's not me. I am above every God. So hopefully we understand the mindset of this one king, this one king. Well, well, we're going to get to the uh, the Antichrist thing in just a second. So, first of all, we're showing that this, this beast is this king and the mindset that this king had during the time period that Christ prophesied about, which was that first century persecution. The reason why the tribulation period happened first century was because of the mindset of this king. So, now, Verse 38, and he shall honor the God of forces on his place. And the God whom his fathers knew not, he shall honor with gold and silver and precious stones and desirable things. And once we uh, go into the book of Revelation, we realize that this is the image of the beast that was set up. He was said that he was a God. That's not a God that his fathers knew. And they was going to honor him, his image, that beast, with gold, silver, and precious stones. The same thing that they gave to the temple in order to honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were going to do the same thing to this guy and worship him as a God, like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is the backstory of what's happening in the first century. This is what's going on during that time period of the tribulation, uh, what's happening in Rome. This is concentrating on, on Rome. Uh, the, the first seven churches, uh, things was happening in Jerusalem, but things was also happening in Rome, in the, out of the Rome providences. And I think we forget that sometimes. So uh, I'm going to open up the room again to see if anyone uh, see it, want to add anything else. Or if not, then I'm, I'm going to continue. So I'll, I'll mute my mic now. All right. Uh, am I still picking up? Can y'all hear me?
Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, God himself um, was an individual, and Magog was a place. So uh, God would be the same king, and Magog would be the territory uh, of the king. So now, um, let's let's continue. Let's continue, man. If anybody else want to add anything, and thank everyone for staying in as long as you did. Uh, I don't know if this is an interesting topic to some, but it's interesting to me. And uh, so now we're finna find out uh, who, because now we know that that's a king. That person right there, that beast, is the king. So now let, let's continue. We're gonna find out more about this antichrist. Let's see if we can find out who the Antichrist is. So Revelation 13, 11, and 12. And I beheld another beast. So this ain't, he said the first beast came out of the sea, right? So now, and I beheld another beast coming up out the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So now, we have another beast introduced and this beast his main objective is to get people to worship the king. The first beast was a king. So now this second beast objective is to get everyone to worship that king whose deadly wound was healed. Now, who was going around healing things? Christ. So what is this doing? It's trying to be a Christ-like individual. And Brother Mike, you, you gave me a verse the other day. Uh, I'm going to ask for that verse in just a second, uh, if you don't mind, if you still got it. Oh, yeah. I, if I can interject one. Okay, okay. Go ahead. My thought was when I bring up God, uh, up on God. But in Ezekiel, when it speaks of God, it has... Um, it has it represented as seven nations coming from the four winds of the earth. And just to prove that comment that you made earlier about the number, not paying too much attention to, on a, the exact numbers, that it, being more paying more attention to the meaning of the numbers. Um, you see in Ezekiel, it speaks of seven nations. Well, obviously, um, the world contains more than seven nations. But it was just a, a complete number. It's a it's a representation of you know what I mean. So I think that that also backs up what you said about the numbers and not getting too caught up with uh, the exact numbers of things and paying more attention to the meaning of the number. But that's what I want to add. Yes, sir. Indeed, I, indeed. In our show, appreciate that, brother. So right there, that's another proof that the brother brought out. Of course, it's more than seven nations. And of course, more than seven nations is going to come in, in, a, in, a, in a war. What kind of war is that? It's only going to have seven nations coming. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't even make sense. But once again, like, like my brother stated, get caught. I mean, don't get caught up in the number. Get caught up in the meaning behind the number. As he stated, that means completion. The, the world was created in seven days. Completion. Is he saying seven 24-hour days? Of course not. It means completion. But, you know, that's how the ancient Hebrews thought. The ancient Hebrews are not modern-day Americans. They're not. They're not American Israelites. They're, they are not. They're not. They're not American Jews. The, the Lord didn't say, hey, I'm going to give you words for Americans to use. That's not what he stated. You have to learn how they thought. They don't have to learn how you thought. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. It's supposed to show you, uh, it's supposed to make that, that cultural barrier, it's supposed to make it leave. But we can't when we get through so much um, 
uh, literalism and not fasting and praying enough on and meditating on scriptures. They used to meditate on scriptures day and night. If scriptures are so plain, why do they have to meditate on them day and night? For weeks at a time, we got proof, historical proof, that some people would go a week without eating. Some groups would go a week without eating, just eating the word. They wake up, study the word from morning until bedtime, went back to sleep, didn't eat, drunk their water, got back up, did the same thing weeks at a time. See, we ain't built like that. This is how they did it in the Eastern world. This is what they did first, second, third century AD. We ain't built like that. In the 21st century, they tell me that a, a hour and a half video was too long. Brother, can you shorten it up? Can you can you take all of God's words and make it be in two minutes, three minutes? You're stretching 10. Can you do that? Meanwhile, I mean, fam, it's facts. And, and, and meanwhile, in the old days, they did it weeks at a time. In the Bible, it said Paul talked so long that a person went to sleep, fell out a window, and died. You know how long a talk that is? <laughs> Damn. Uh, uh, it said that when, uh, was it, was it, um, uh, it might have been this, during the time of Nehemiah, Ezra, Ezra. It said that Ezra, when he when they got from the Babylonian captivity, uh, he stood up on like a little podium thing, and he read the Torah, just the Torah, from morning to night, and they got up the next day and did the same thing. So, no, I can't cut down my lessons to an uh, hour, I mean, sorry, 10 minutes, 8 minutes. Now, I do little skits and, and stuff because I'm, I'm good with doing little 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 skits and stuff. I'm good with that. And, and, uh, quick points to break down one or two verses. But when we talk about the word of God and, and eating from it, no, I'm not going to, no, I'm not cutting it down. We are one hour and 37 minutes strong right now, and I say I'm going to keep going. So, so. So, but uh, but my bad. I didn't mean to go on that rant. But now, uh, anybody else want to add anything else before I keep going? <laughs> Watch the Titanic. Facts, man. Facts. Uh, the the I know the Avengers movies seem like ooh, about four hours. So and <laughs> they go watch that. So yes, sir, indeed. Indeed, indeed. And sorry about the signals, y'all. I, I, the signals, I don't know why they so acting so weird tonight. But, uh, but yeah, so now, so that was Revelation 13. What's up, Bob? I saw you come in the room, brother. Uh, that was Revelation 13, 11, and 12. So now, let's go to 13 and 14. Let's find out about this beast that wanted them to worship the other beast. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, in the sight of the king, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the king, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So this, uh, um, in fact, let's go to 15 too. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, what should this do right here, y'all? We're Bible students, right? We take this serious. If we read this, we should understand where this is almost parallel to. This is almost parallel to, once again, the Genesis narrative with the creation Of man, and, and, and my brother, uh, 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 Mike, did you want to say something? 
Did you did you want to say something? Okay, okay then. All right, all right. Uh, and just, and just, and just uh, yeah, go ahead. Did you read that verse yet? Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. Just a second. Just a second. So now, um, we have in in Genesis chapter one and two, we got the creation of man, right? Especially Genesis two. What happened in Genesis two? He breathed into man, man became a living soul. What happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26? God said, let us make man in our image. And he created male and female, right? So now, verse number 15 in Revelation, they made an image not unto God, not into the word, but into the beast. Why did they make an image to the beast? Because the beast was saying that he was God. So now the beast is saying he was God. They saying, let us make an image into this God. Just like in Genesis, when the deities in the heavenly realm were saying, let us make man in our image. So this beast is saying, is trying to do the same thing that God did. And what else did he do? He caused many that would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So his creation narrative is through ruling through punishment, through death. See, the men and women were supposed to have a, a, a made after the image of God they were supposed to have authority over the animals and over the earth and et cetera, right? They were supposed to live in a community and they were supposed to have authority over anyone that was pretty much wicked as well as the animals. Now, you have this person, this system, this, these people, they're making the image unto their God, their king, and they said, anyone who wouldn't worship this king will be killed. Paying more homage to the king. He's not sharing power, not sharing dominion with the community. It's all about this one king. And what else is this beast doing? Verse 14. He's deceiving them that dwell on the earth. By means of miracles. Now, the miracle that he did, it was a specific miracle. He made fire come down from heaven to the earth. We see something uh, similar. I think that was Elijah who made the fire come down uh, to the sacrifice to the word uh, when he went against the Baal prophets, the, ba the Baal prophets. So, this is very important. He's making fire come down from heaven. Not only that, he's giving power to the beast, the image of the beast, that the image of the beast could speak and cause as many people that would not worship him to be killed. All right, uh, uh, go ahead with the verse, brother. Now, now I'm ready.
thing that the Lord is doing. Right. So, and my brother found that uh that verse, and, and he he sent it to me. He said, "Bro, what about this?" One? And I was like, "I didn't even know that was there, my brother, but I'm so sure appreciate it. I'm definitely gonna need it." So right there, we have once again that that beast, uh, and this false prophet, right, deceiving people by trying to uh copy what the Lord has done. Israel had a fatal wound. The Lord healed Israel's fatal wound. Here, the beast had a, favor, a, a fatal wound, and the beast's fatal wound was healed. He's copying. He's mimicking the Lord. And why is he doing this? Because he said, I am God. But notice, he's not doing nothing like a God. He's not doing nothing new. He's just mimicking God, and he's taking all the credit for himself. Because he had told himself that he's God. And he believed that he is God. We see Paul was talking about the same God who went in the temple of God, exalting himself being God, saying that he is God. It happened first century. But now, notice here in Revelation 13. What did it state also? And thank you for the verse, my brother. Revelation 13, 14. He deceived them that dwell on earth by miracles. And we know that the Messiah himself did miracles. So now, let's go to a warning. You go to Matthew 24. They asked, when Christ told them the destruction of the temple was going to happen, they asked him, hey, when will these things be? What is the sign of your presence and of the end of the age, right? This is what Christ told them. Matthew 24, verse number 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So now, we read in, in Revelation 13, it was another beast that came and deceived the earth. Here in Matthew, we got Christ saying, let no man deceive you. Christ knew all, right? Christ had the Holy Spirit. He the word. He knew all. So the symbolism behind the beast in Revelation is actually a man. Just like the beast, the first beast was a king who is a man, not a kingdom, but a king. Here we find out that the second beast, is going to be a man. So now, verse 5. And many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse number 11. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Right? And then verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And so much, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So now we, re we read in Revelation 13 that, these, that this beast, that was able to create this image and etc. He was able to deceive the world and to do miracles. Now we got Christ who stated earlier that false Christ and false prophets were going to do great signs and wonders and if it was possible would even deceive the very elect. But it's not possible. How? Because the elect had the Holy Spirit. But the people who didn't have the Holy Spirit, they was able to be deceived by the miracles produced by the false Christ and false prophets. So what do you have in Revelation 13? You have a king who is what? A false Christ. Then in Revelation 13, you have another beast come up, which is what? A false prophet. 
So you got the false Christ and the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13. I know people are like, who is it? Who is it? We're going to find out who it is. But now, let's keep going. 1 John 4. Let's read 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. See, this was a first century revelation. I know people want to look at the Christian church today and say, hey, it's T.D. Jakes and uh, Joel Osteen and uh, Creflo Dollar and whatever Christian church you go to around every corner, it's them. No. Okay, if that's what you want to go with that. But in the historical biblical narrative, this was occurring first century. This is first century revelation. This isn't 21st century Western world revelation. I know people want the Bible to be all about us because we're arrogant like that. Americans are arrogant to believe everything is supposed to be about us. We're very arrogant. We have been taught to be arrogant. Meanwhile, we don't have the patience of Christ, neither the knowledge of the Bible. But here, this is a first century revelation. They was actually experiencing this. First century. So now, he said, many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. So now he's trying to explain how you knew in the first century a person was a false prophet or not. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Does that seem like something the beast in Revelation 13 would have said? Does this seem like something the horn in Daniel 7 would have said? No, they were magnifying themselves above any and every deity, above any and every God. They would not have confessed this. So now, verse 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that of Antichrist. Whereof ye heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So that Antichrist and that spirit of Antichrist was going over in the world already. Christ stated it was going to happen in Matthew 24 when he was on the earth. That was around 29, 30 A.D. So now we got John that's coming later on in the 60s uh, A.D. or the 50s, 60s A.D. This after 20, 30 years. Now, what Christ told them 30 years ago, it's finally occurring in our time period. Not 2,030 years in a place that nobody knows nothing about called America. Uh, this is going to be a place, Christ was like, hey, it's going to be a place called America. And I know you guys are being killed right now in front of me. And I know you guys are going to be killed in the, in the future. I saw it. All you guys are going to be persecuted for my name's sake. They're going to plague you. They're going to crucify you. They're going to set some of you guys on fire. They're going to scourge you in your synagogues. But there's going to be a place called America that comes 2,000 years in the future. And it's going to be people get, get killed by somebody called police. And then they're going to be something. They're going to wear costumes that you know we don't wear stuff like that but they're going to wear it and then they're going to say they're waking up the 12 tribes of israel this is no christ didn't do none of that he told them what was going to happen and now we see it happening first century in real time we're reading it in the bible so now he says now the antichrist has already came in the world so once you are in the book of revelation reading about the Antichrist, understand that that guy that was spoken of of being the Antichrist, the one that we're reading in Revelation 13, he was alive when John, 1 John, was written. He was alive when Thessalonians was written. He was alive when all of the books of the New Testament was written. He was alive. He wasn't in power when Christ was on the scene. He got power 
uh, years later, but he was alive during the time period. So anything that you're reading in the book of the New Testament, it occurred first century. I know you guys want it to be 21st century, but it occurred first century. So now, let's go to 2 Peter now. Let's go to 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring unto themselves swift destruction. So what were they doing? Denying the Lord. What was the fake prophets doing in Revelation 13? Denying the Messiah said, I did it all myself. This is all through my work, my muscle, my con, uh, cunningness, and all of that stuff, and etc. Verse 2, and many shall follow their per pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feign words, make merchandise of you, that's that slavery, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not now that judgment that people are talking about the 2000 year man christ is coming any day now watch and see oh uh, look at russia and 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 uh ukraine fight gog and magog for the a thousandth time gog and magog is here now wait and see any end of the world go outside listen to the horns and all of that ruckus that people are saying about the Bible being fulfilled in today's time, and when nothing happens, what's going to happen? People are going to drop from the faith even more. Then some people are going to say, oh, no, this is just the beginning of it. It's going to take time because, you know, they was wrong, and they don't want to say they was wrong, and etc." So all of the false prophets is going to show themselves. But regardless, we see here in Second Peter, he said, the judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So we see it right there that, uh, even Peter was saying the time is pretty much this it's going to happen now. I don't know why we make it be our time period when he clearly tells us it, it was their time period. Everything in the Bible, if you guys don't understand what I'm saying, everything in the Bible has been fulfilled. We're reading history. It's not our time period. It's not about us. It's about them. We're reading their records. We're enjoying the kingdom and etc. So now, let's continue. Let's go to Colossians 2. 18. Listen to what, what Paul now said. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Uh oh. Now, what happened? inside see y'all don't understand paul a lot of people don't understand paul and this is why they so confused when you talk about paul the first thing they want to talk about the law paul wasn't talking about no law he's trying to get people ready for the kingdom of heaven just like christ was y'all are the one worried about the law of moses that's not what paul was doing but notice what paul said in truth uh let no man beguile you of your reward which is what the garden of everlasting life, the tree of life, and worshiping of angels. What was Adam? Adam was an angel, son of God. Anybody that's sons of God could be considered messengers or angels. Intru uh, intruded into those things which he had not seen. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. What happened inside of the Garden of Eden? Someone was puffed up. Mankind was puffed up in their fleshly mind and start wanting to worship each other. What did it say? You will be like gods, knowing good and evil. What is that? Idolatry. Why? Because they wanted to be like what? Gods. Wanting to be a god means that you want to be worshipped. You that's idolatry. In other words, that's another name for idol idolatry. Man worship. What is this guy doing in, in Revelation 13? He's saying that he's God. What did he eat from? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, what's happening in Daniel 2, Daniel 7? What happened? Wanted to be 
gods, magnified above God of heaven, wanted to be gods themselves. Where did they get this understanding from? Eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, puffing up themselves, plus uh, puffed up by their fleshly mind. This king was puffed up by his fleshly mind. He thought he was the son of God, but of what God was he supposed to be the son of? We're going to find out momentarily. So now, Ephesians. So Paul 2.18, that's straight from the Garden of Eden. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And this is what Christ did. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ you see how everything is going toward Christ and not this antichrist that verse 14 that we Henceforth, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So this is what everything was supposed to be for, perfecting of the body of Christ. This, the uh, in Revelation 13, they was, these other people who were being deceived, they was trying to be part of that quote-unquote antichrist. They were being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They were being deceived by the miracles and etc. They were not for Christ. They were being uh, led away by their own uh, fleshly minds, right? So now, um, let's see here. We're going to find out exactly. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement here. I'm going to make a bold statement. Christ was king, Christ was priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, when you want to know anything about the kingly Messiah, there's scriptures for it. If you want to know anything about the priestly Messiah, there's scriptures for it. But guess what? These two individual Offices are the same individual. I'm here to make the claim that the beast of, thir of Revelation 13, that eighth king, I'm here to make the proclamation that he is also the false prophet. Just like Christ is king and prophet, and he's the, the same person, I am here to say the king and prophet in Revelation 13 is the same exact person. And I'm going to try to prove it. But before I do that, I'm going to open the chat up. Anybody want to say something before uh, I continue? Am I still picking up? All right, uh, anybody want to say nothing? If not, I'm going to actually start revealing who this Antichrist and who this false king was. All right, bet. So without further ado, let's get into who this individual was. Now, the actual understanding is actually in the book of Revelation. And if you know a little bit of history, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so now, Remember, everyone, I told y'all, the setting of the book of Revelation is first century persecution, first century tribulation. 
That's the setting of it. So now, we're going to go to Revelation 9, verse number 11. This actually explains, if, if you was living in the first century, and you got this read to you, without a hundred thousand million uh, percent, I went with a hundred thousand million percent, you would have automatically known who this was with this one verse. And the king, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, we know Paul said, don't be worshiping angels, right? But, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So now this angel, he, he's, he's ruling the pit of death. Uh, sorry, uh, he's from the pit of death, my bad. Whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek, so we have a little Greek here, tongue, his name is Apollyon. So we have this guy named Abaddon, this king, 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 his name, this king is also called an angel. So this king, his in the Hebrew tongue, he's a bad. In the Greek tongue, this king is Apollyon. So once you go to Revelation 17, verse 8. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. You see how you have to have the book of Revelation to explain the book of Revelation? So you see in Revelation 9 and 11, it let it be known that this was a king that came out of the bottomless pit, and this king also was an angel, right? So they had a king over them who was the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue, Apollyon. So, once you go to Revelation 17, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was, is not, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And then in verse 10, you find out Sorry, the verse 11, the eighth is the, sorry, the beast is the eighth king. So the book of Revelation told you twice that this is a king. This beast is a king. One king, not kingdom, not kingdoms with an S, not uh, the Ottoman Turks, not anyone, not uh. The, the Russians or all the other people, this is one king. And this king came out of the bottomless pit. And we find out, uh, if you keep reading, in fact, let's read a little bit more. Let's go back to Revelation 9. So we know a little bit more about this, this king who was also the beast. What did this king do? Verse 1, and the, uh, Revelation 9 and 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Did we not read that the devil got cast out of heaven and went unto the earth? Is the devil not an, considered, quote, unquote, in this angelic being, this star, this angel? And look, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of the great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. You got Christ right there. What did Christ say in Matthew 24? The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give off her light. Here, what do we have in Revelation 9 too? The sun and the air was darkened because of the smoke of the pit. <clears throat> so they're talking about the same thing. So verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And if y'all don't understand, this is actually piggybacking the plagues that happened in Egypt. 
and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power. Uh-oh. So now, who's given them power? This star that fell from heaven. Who gave the beast power? The dragon. What was the dragon representing? Inward lust, inward desire, inward ties. So anyway, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And if anyone don't understand what this is talking about, I'm here to explain all of this stuff. Right? Well, I'm, let me let me read down. I'm gonna explain all of it. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. This is actually what happened in Revelation chapter 7 with the sealing of the 144,000. When the four winds, when the angels was holding the four winds of heaven, he told them, hurt not the trees or the grass or the earth until that we have sealed the, angel, I mean the, the, the children of Israel in their forehead. So we find out in Revelation 9, What's equivalent to the angels holding back the four winds of earth is actually this locust army. So now, verse 5. So this is all warfare talk and symbolism. So verse 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, I want everyone to imagine in your head, in your brains right now, you can do it with your eyes closed or your eyes open. What does it look like when a scorpion strikes a man? What does it look like? Y'all know a scorpion has the hook on his back. So when a scorpion strikes a man, the hook on his back comes forward and it hits the man, right? Think about it in your mind. The hooks on the back come forward and it hits the man. That's going to make sense in just a second. So now, verse number six. And in those days, man shall seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Mm. They, they want to die, right? Death shall flee from them. There's no committing suicide. There's no more um, uh, idolatry. There's no more praying to former gods. Uh, you know, the death came. We want to be like gods, knowing good and evil. Not no more. <laughs> they desired to be like gods. They wanted to know this and that. That's gone. It fled from them. That whole wanting to be gods and, and, and that, that whole wanting to commit suicide, all of that stuff is all gone. So verse 7, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads as were the crowns like gold. And their faces were the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were the breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle and their tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails and their power and their power was to hurt men five months and then they had the king over them called Abaddon right and then you ask anybody hey uh could you tell me what that mean what's all that right there man in revelation chapter 9 when they get done describing it to you, it's going to sound like X-Men. It's going to be like superhero stuff. Yeah, it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be a Superman. It's going to be like a mutant, right? It's going to be a man. He's going to walk around. This is this is the DNA. They create different different people with DNA right now. So that's what you're seeing. It ain't got nothing to do with none of that. It ain't got, it ain't got nothing to do with, it, it's not sci-fi. This is not a sci-fi movie. It's not sci-fi channel. This is symbolism. So this is what's happening. First of all, if you go back into uh, Deuteronomy 32, 30 through 32, read it slow. These are the curses that was going to come upon Israel. And this is the language that was said, um, that uh, he's going to send uh, the teeth of be. In fact, uh, we had Revelation 9. I'm just going to quote it real fast for you. I'm, I'm just going to use the KJV. Uh, 
I think it's Deuteronomy. Let me see if it's Deuteronomy 30. Let me go to 31 first. I'm just going to see if I can find it real fast. Uh, my anger shall have had, it shall come to pass, the congregation of Israel. Let me go to 32. Um, see, that, 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 Lord, uh, wax fast. Where is it at? Right here. Deuteronomy 32, 24. And they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. So this is destruction right here, right? Uh, I will send the teeth of beasts upon them. What do we have in Deuteronomy? I mean, Revelation? Their face like the lions. That's teeth of beasts, all of that stuff. With the poison of serpents of the dust. Uh, the sword without the terror within. Uh, I will destroy young men and virgins. I will scatter them into four, the four corners and etc. Right? So this is part of that right there. It says, um, let's go to uh, Daniel 7. So that's the song of Moses, the curses that was going to come on them for being wicked. You go to Daniel 7, verse number, let's see here, 7. The fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, it had great iron teeth. Fourth beast had iron teeth. All right. So then I think you can also go to Joel chapter 1. When you go to Joel chapter 1, look, listen to what it says. Uh, verse 2. Hear ye, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or, every, or even in the days of your fathers? Uh, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Uh, let, me speak, let me go down to line, uh, six. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of a great lion. You have it right there. It's a nation coming against them, and the nation has teeth like a lion. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if we can find something else. Uh, it's some, I think the locust. Yep, yeah, verse 4. Which the palmer worm has eaten, the uh, hath left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust has eaten, the canker worm eaten. And the canker worm has left the caterpillar eating. So now you have the symbolism of the locust, which represented another nation. You have the symbolism of the lion with great teeth, which represented a nation coming against them, and etc. So all of the stuff that you're reading in the book of Revelation, it's already been stated in the Law and the Prophets. It's just symbolism for a nation coming against uh, Jerusalem. And what Joel chapter 2, it's a day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness. The morning shall be spread in the mountains, a great people and a strong that thou hast not ever seen like them. Neither shall be any more till the years of the generations uh, will come. A fire will devour before them, and behind them a flame burneth in the land of garden, in the land of the garden of Eden. I'm not going to read all of this, but anyway, it's just symbolism for a nation coming against Jerusalem. That's all it is. And you ask anybody what it is, they make it be real sci-fi-ish. So now, talking about that scorpion, right? It, they they kind of look like a locust. They look like locusts, and then they got the powers of the scorpions, right? I don't know if anyone has seen an old school catapult, but if you have seen an old school catapult, it's shaped just like a locust. Pull it up. It's put it right beside each other. An old school Roman catapult is shaped just like a locust. And what do the catapult do? From its back, it shoots large stones forward. What do a scor what do a scorpion do? From its back, it stings forward. So just like the sting of a scorpion, these people will be inflicted. This is this it's war talk. It's a catapult that's destroying them. That's all it is. Catapults. And then when it says they're gonna have long hair like women, 
What did uh, uh, Paul teach? He said, don't nature show you that men shouldn't have long hair? So in other words, this is just something that's going against nature. It's going against the natural order of things. That's all it is. So all this is, the, the, the scorpions coming up, the, the, the lions, the tigers, the bears, oh my, the, the horses, the chariots, the angels, and all that stuff is all symbolic for the Romans coming in to destroy Jerusalem in the first century. That's all it is. But now, let's talk about this Abaddon person. Who is this king who has this uh, army of locusts, who has this people that look like lions and stuff? Who is this king known as Abaddon or in the Greek tongue? Apollo. Who is this king? Because once you find out who this king is, by default, you know who exactly this Antichrist is, who exactly this beast is, what time period exactly is the book of Revelation talking about. So now, let's find out who the king is. We're going to look for someone who's, uh, who, we're going to look for a king who is called Abaddon and Apollo. So, we're going to go through just a little history. We're going to look at, let's see here. Sorry. Let's go to my email. Uh, let's look at, we got it here under andrewjacobs.org, Christian origin. Uh, this says the earliest Roman sources on Christianity. I'm going to read section three. This is Tacticus Annals, book 15, chapter 44. Hello, does anyone want to say something before I uh, actually expose who this king is? Anybody? We finna get started. All right, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Indeed, then. So here we go. Um, notice. Now, this false prophet, what did he do? He made fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Right? Now, picture yourself living in the first century. You are part of the seven churches, which are not in the land of Canaan. You are in Asia Minor. You are in the Roman provinces. Right? You are in the provinces of Rome. So, uh, you have heard and you are experiencing, if you haven't heard, you are experiencing uh, persecution firsthand. Let's go through some history of what happened. This is from Tacticus, book 15, chapter 44. It says, Tacticus is somewhat grumpy and pessimistic in textual intellectual and historian who eventually became a career a politician. His, uh, let's see here, he wrote several works critical of the emperors of the first century CE. First century CE, this is when Christ was on the scene. This is when the New Testament was written, including the book of Revelation. His annals was written in the first or second decade of the second century before 120 CE and include a long reference to Christians in the context of his criticism of the Emperor Nero. So now, he's, he, he knew things about Christians, right? Same Christians were being, that were being persecuted in the New Testament, the same Christians that was getting written to. And we know Christians consisted of all nationalities in the first century. I don't care what camp say or anybody else, this is a reality. This is his history. The same with Western people make up. This is historical information. So now, listen to what happened. A great fire swept through the city of Rome in 64 AD. And many suspect, suspected that Nero himself set the fire so he could rebuild sections of the city. 
Tacticus explains that the Christians provided a convenient scapegoat for the emperor to avoid suspicion. So, here we go. This is what he wrote. But no human effort nor lavish gifts of the emperor or placations of the gods turned away the suspicions of those who believe that the fire was ordered. Therefore, so that the rumor would be abolished, Nero falsely ascribed criminal blame and applied the most extra, uh, extraordinary punishments on a, so, uh, on a certain vulgar crowd called Christians, hated for their wrongdoings. The uh, eponymous founder of this group was a certain Christus, who was during the reign of Tiberius inflicted with punishment by a procurator, Pontius Pilate. This destructive superstition, held in check for a while, erupted again, not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, but through the city of Rome itself, where all frightful and shameful things come together and are celebrated. So first they were arrested who confessed. Then, so what happened? The people who confessed to follow Christ were arrested. So guess what? The people who didn't confess, they wasn't arrested. Then when they turned informant, an enormous throne was found guilty. Not necessarily just for the crime of arson, of arson, as for hate, as for hatred of the human race, and mockery was piled on those who were dying, as they were covered with animal hides and died from the mangling of dogs, or they were nailed up to be up to cross, and set on fire and were used as night lamps when the day ended. Nero offered up, up his own gardens for this spectacle and set up circus games, mingling with the common people of a charioter. So he's riding on a chariot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make, it's, that's important. An outfit and moving around the racetrack. From this, even in response to deserved criminals and the latest warning examples, a certain piety arose. And so forth, as much if it was not for the public good, but for one person's uh, savagery, that they were being consumed. So, we have historical facts that Nero not only set the city of Rome on fire, he then set Christians on fire inside of his garden. So now, what did the book of Revelation say? That this anti, this, this prophet who had these miracles, what was he able to do? Cause fire to come from heaven up on earth. What was Nero able to do? Burn the the most prominent, quote unquote, prominent city of the time, the most powerful empire at the time. Nero was able to set its pro that the Rome part of it, on, not all of the provinces, but the Rome part of it, where it's the national station was. He was able to set the city on fire, as well as the Christians, the followers of Christ. So, a few things happened there. The people who confessed Christ died. They were nailed to crosses. They were burned alive. The people who didn't confess Christ, they live. Christ said, if you live, if you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you save it. That's a martyrdom speech, just in case people don't understand. That's, very, that's pretty much a martyrdom speech. 
If you try to lose your life, you're going to save it. If you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. The people who took the mark of the beast tried to save their life. They lost it at the end, according to Revelation. And the people who didn't take the mark of the beast, when they lost their life, they actually saved their life because we see them reigning and ruling with Christ during the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20. But regardless, we have Nero setting fire on the fourth beast system, the, 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 the capital, as well as the followers of Christ. So I can see a connection of this false prophet making fire come down from heaven on earth where all of the fire that Nero said about. No matter if it was Rome or the Christian himself, Nero did it all himself. All right, so that's one of them, right? So let's read another fact about Nero. We have something, let's see, I want to, I don't want to read that just yet. Uh, let's read, hold on, let me find it. All right, this is an article on Shim, the Shim, Shim Romach, Shim Romach, S-H-E-M-R-O-M-A-C-H, dot blogspot dot com. It says, Apollo. October 15, 2020. It says, uh, I'm just going to read uh, like a paragraph or two. There is with little doubt a link between Apollyon and Apollo. Let me elaborate. The name Apollyon is the Greek play on words for Apollo, Apollon, I mean, uh, Apollon in Greek, and destroyer. Revelation 9 and 11 reads, they had a king over them, the angel of the abyss, who name, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is destroyer. Abaddon means destruction or ruin, which is uh, Apollia in Greek. Though Abaddon means destruction or ruin, it is truly the place of destruction or ruin, which in Greek is Hades or Bustles or Abyssals, abyss. Why does John call the angel of the, the abyss the name for destruction or the place for destruction in Hebrew, but then use the Greek word Apollyon, meaning destroyer, which is not an exact Greek translation of the Hebrew Abaddon? John appears to call the angel of the abyss Apollyon rather than using more exact Greek translations of Abaddon like Apollia or Hades or Bussus or Bussus because of the similarity between the words destroyer, Apollyon, and Apollo, Apollon, in Greek. In other words, this word selection appears to be a play, I mean, a word play for Apollo, Apollon, the destroyer, Apollyon. The fact that Apollyon is used intentionally called to mind the god Apollo is hinted throughout Revelation 9, the Anchor Bible Dictionary says the following concerning the, leaks, the link between Apollyon and Apollo. In one manuscript, instead of Apollyon, the text reads Apollo, the Greek god of death and pestilence, or plague like the plague of locusts mentioned in Revelation 9. Hold on now. So now we're going to drop some, some, finally some facts. So Apollo was the God over plagues. What did Moses bring? Plagues on Egypt. So we got Apollo being God of plagues also, and some of those plagues include locusts. And what do we have Apollyon being? The uh, angel over the locust army. Okay, so now, Apollyon is no doubt the correct reading, but the name Apollo Greek Apollon was often linked in ancient Greek writings with the verb Apollyme or Apollyo, destroyer. From, that, from this time of Grotitius, Apollyon had often been taken here to be a play on the name Apollo. The locust was an emblem of this god. Okay, so now we have Apollo, I mean Apollyon, by some scholars uh, dealing with the ancient world, in the ancient world, 
was a play on the word of Apollo, the Greek god Apollo, dealing with destruction or ruins, which is Abaddon. So it's just a Greek, it's a play on words. It's a play on the Greek god Apollo. So now, why would I bring up Apollo? Why would Apollyon and Apollo, how would that help anybody know who this king was? Well, let's go to Edward Chaplin's uh, excerpt on Nero, Apollo, and the poets. This is what he says. Toward the end of his reign, Nero ostentatiously identified himself with Apollo the Scythiorode, most notoriously in the great elastic triumph of late 67, 67 AD, which culminated with sacrifice not only to uh, Capitoline Jupiter, but to Palatine Apollo as well, and to Sol in the Circus Maximus, uh, C-U-S-T Nero 25, anyway. By then, Nero felt that his position as the equal of Apollo as a singer and soul as a charioter. Now, we, were, we read earlier how Nero was riding on the chariot when uh, he was setting the Christians on fire, was assured. And Apollo, the divine lyre player, adorned his coin. When did God and emperor first associate? Uh, let's see if I can keep reading. Let's see if there's something else. Uh, J. Tony B. answered the question 60 years ago in his paper on Nero artifacts, the apocalypticianus, I can't read that, reconsidered. Uh, Tibony cited Tacticus, Annals 14.14-15. And Cassius Dio, and I actually has, have these, uh, uh, text me or send me a back chat if you want these articles. 61.19 through 21. To the effect that after the murder of Agrippina, Nero indulged in his long suppressed desire to race chariots and to sing on stage. Song was sacred to Apollo. And that famous god of prophecy was represented in a musician's dress, Tacticus. That's what he stated. And that his chosen band of Augustinia then held him at his stage performance in the Juvenalia of 59 with the words of glorious Caesar. So this is what they said. Our Apollo, our Augustus, another Pythian. Uh, Tobini concluded that the Apollo aspect of the affair seems to be something quite new in 59. We have no trace of it in the early years of Nero's reign. So in other words, when they did this banqueting and stuff, uh, Nero was riding around singing and etc. And the people was praising him as Apollo. The people was praising Nero as Apollo. They was calling Nero Apollo. So now, we have, this is history. This is historical information. This is, I'm not making this up. So, in the, the history of Nero's rulership and reign, in his latter years, he was acting like Apollo, and he was being praised and worship as Apollo. So now, let's continue. Uh, let's find out some more attributes about Apollo. So this is Nero being called Apollo. So let's find out attributes about Apollo because these attributes would have to go to Nero if they are worshiping Nero as Apollo. So this is the New World Encyclopedia about Apollo. So it says, in Greek and Roman mythology, Apollo was the god of light, truth, archery, music, medicine, and healing. 
but also the bringer of deathly plagues. So now, understand this. Apollo, he was the god of light. What is Christ? Christ was supposed to be the one who brought light. What was Apollo? The god of truth. What was Christ supposed to bring? Grace and truth. What was Apollo? The god of archery. What do we have in Revelation chapter 6? The first horseman. Let, let, let's just read it real fast. What did the first horseman have in Revelation chapter 6? The one that represents this fake Christ. Because we know in Revelation uh, 19, Christ came on. Let's read that. In Revelation 19, Christ came on. Let's see here. 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes was like the flame of a fire, and on his head were many crowns. So he came in Revelation 19 on a white horse. He was making war, and he had many crowns on his head. Let's see what's happening in Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation 6 and 1, and when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard as it was the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts said, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this first being, this Antichrist figure, and because I know they want this to be Christ in Revelation 6 too, that, that don't make sense at all. But this Antichrist figure, he is an archer. He has a bow. Now what is Apollo? The god of archery. He has a bow. And not only that, he's the god of music, medicine, and healing. What did Christ do? He brought healing. He was healing those that were sick. What also happened? In the book of Revelation, we find out that the beast that had a deadly wound was healed. What is Apollo? The god of healing. And also the bringer of a deathly plagues. What did the locusts bring? A plague. What was the Apollyon over? The locust army. Who did they refer to as Apollo in the Roman uh, provinces? Nero. Who persecuted the Christians? Nero. Who set Rome on fire? Nero. Who set the Christians on fire? Nero. What did the false prophets do? The, the false prophet. He brought fire from the heaven onto earth. So hopefully we can see the connection with Nero. And then if we keep reading, it says, Apollo represents harmony, order, and reason. His, his characteristics contrasted those of Dionysius, god of wine, who represents ecstasy and disorder. Uh, let's see if I can find anything else about Apollo. Uh, let's see here. Apollo attributes and symbols. Let's see if there's anything here. Apollo's most common attributes were the bow and arrow. The Cathara, a very, uh, which is the lyre, uh, uh, the Plectrum, and the Sword. Other well-established emblems were the sacrificial tripod, representing his prophetic powers. So he was a prophet also. He was a prophet. What do we have in the book of Revelation? A false prophet. Let's keep reading. And the golden mean. Animals sacred to Apollo included wolves, dolphins, roe deers, swans, grasshoppers, symbolizing music and songs, hawks, ravens, crows, snakes, in reference to Apollo's function as the god of prophecy. Mice and griffins, myth, uh, mythical eagle, lion, hybrids of eastern origin. So all of these things represented Apollo. Uh, I'm going to read one more thing. Apollo, like other Greek deities, had a number of epithets applied to him. 
reflecting the variety of roles, duties, and aspects ascribed to him. However, while Apollo had a great number of appellations in Greek myth, only a few occurred in Latin literature, chief among uh, Phoebus, the shining one, which was very commonly used by both Greeks and Romans to denote Apollo's role as the god of light, and Apollo's role as a healer, him being a healer, and etc. So we have all of these attributes dealing with Apollo, and they call Nero Apollo. So now, what else happened? Uh, it said in um, Revelation 19 that an image was created, and whoever didn't worship this image was supposed to be put to death, and he was going to give a, a, a voice to this image, let the image speak and give life to this image, right? So once we go to academic.com, in academic.com, Dealing with the Colossus of Nero, this is what it states. The Colossus of uh, Neroness, Latin, the Colossus of Nero, was an enormous bronze statue that the Emperor Nero, 37 through 68 AD, had erected in his image in the vestibule of the Domus Arua. His palatial residence on the Palatine Hill. The statue was placed just outside the main palace entrance at the terminus of the Via Appia in a large atrium of porticos that divided the city from the private villa. The Greek architect uh, Zenodorus uh, designed the statue and began construction between A.D. 64 and 68. According to Pliny the Elder, the statue reached 106.5 Roman feet, 30.3 meters in height, though other sources claim it was much as 37 meters. So not only did was Nero called uh, Apollo, and he got all the attributes of Apollo, he had a statue built of himself, erected in the Roman provinces, right? So, let's see, is there any more that we can add to it? Let's see here. I think that should pretty much do it. My bad, y'all. Uh, so, we have all of this proof that Nero fits the bill. All of this proof. So, now, uh, I got one more section that I want to go through, but does anyone want to add anything right now? If not, I got one more section I want to go through. Nobody want to say anything? We good? Nobody. I see you in the I see you in the audience. Hold on, well, uh, let me see. Can someone ping him in a room? Let me see here. I just pinged him. I just pinged you. All right, so now, uh, and I'm finna get ready to uh to finish it up. Okay, so now. This is going to be all of the Mark of the Beast. Because for some reason, uh, people think the Mark of the Beast is only a revelation reality. But the Mark of the Beast happened several times throughout history. So we're going to go through how the Mark of the Beast, what the Mark of the Beast looked like. Right? So if anyone wouldn't worship the beast, uh, he would be put to death. So let's just go through uh, the mark of the beast, right? 
Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we go through the Mark of the Beast, I got one more thing to show about uh, Nero. So once we go to, let's see if it'll pull up. Once we go to the Ascension of Isaiah, which is right here, uh, this is what state. This is um, chapter 4. It says, and now Hezekiah and Josiah, my son, these are the days of the completion of the world or age. After it is consummated, Belier, the great ruler and king of the world, will descend who had ruled it since it came into being. Yea, he will descend from the firmament in the likeness of a man, a lawless king, the slayer of his mother, and we know that was Nero, who himself, even this king, will persecute the plant which the twelve apostles of the beloved have planted. That's the Christians. Of the twelve, one will be delivered into his hands. Uh, I think Paul and Peter, I think, was killed by Nero. This ruler in the form of that king will come, and there will come with him all the powers of this world, and they will hearken unto him and all that he desires. And at his word, the sun will rise at night, and he will make the moon to appear in the sixth hour. And all that he had desired, he would do in the world. And he will do and speak like the beloved. And he will say, I am God, and before me there has been none. And all the people of the world will believe in him. And they will sacrifice to him, and they will serve him, saying, This is God, and beside him there is no other. And the greater number of those who shall have been associated together in order to receive the beloved, he will turn aside after him. And there will be the power of his miracles in every city and region. And he will set up his image before him in every city. And he shall bear sway three years and seven months and 20 days, 27 days. So here, even in the ascension of Isaiah, it's a first century work. Uh, we have the creator of this work he actually put Nero as being the king and Antichrist also. So the king in Revelation 13, the first and second beast in Revelation 13, he gave both attributes to Nero. Same thing that I did because it makes sense him mimicking Christ being king and priest. So we got Nero being false king and false priest uh, or Antichrist or false prophet, however you want to put it. So we have, once again, another historical document making this be Nero. All right, I just wanted to, to, to point that out too. So now, let's just finish up. Let's see a other Mark of the Beast. Uh, once you go to Daniel 3, where is that? All right, there we go. Daniel 3, 1 through 6. One. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna read this down here. In his 18th year, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made a golden image. Its height was 60 cubits. Its breadth six cubits. So that's that play on 66 right there. And he set it up in the plain of Adera, in the province of Babylon. Verse number three. So the head of provinces, the governors the captains, the chief, the great princes, and those who were in authority, and all the rulers of the districts were gathered, was gathered to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, ye people, tribes, and languages, at what hour ye shall hear the sound of the trumpet, and pipe, and harp, and sackbut, and psaltery, and every kind of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whosoever shall not fall down and worship in the same hour, he shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. So that's the first thing about the mark of the beast. Uh, them not worshiping the image of the beast, which Nebuchadnezzar was the first beast. He was the first king. They didn't worship the image of that beast. <clears throat> and what happened to them? They would be put to death, put to death. So that's the first time the mark of the beast was introduced. 
So then we go to uh, First Maccabees 1. Now this is under the Greeks. First Maccabees 1, uh, 41 through 50. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote in, to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed it to idols and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers into Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and holy people. Let me see if I still have it. Yes, it's going on 50. Set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable and all with all manner of uncleanliness and prof, uh, profanation. To the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. So that's the second time the mark of the beast came about. Then you go to 2 Maccabees 6, three, 1 and 2. Not long after, the, after this king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and not live afterwards after the laws of God and to pollute also the temple of Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter, Olympias, and that in Gerizim of Jupiter, the defender of strangers, as they desire to dwell in the place. So he's actually did it in uh, Gerizim too, that they was to uh, do away with their system of worship and to put on the system of the heathen. So now, uh, I want to go to 18 through 23. Eleazar, one of the principal scribes, an aged man of a well-favored countenance, was constrained to open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh. But he, choosing rather to die gloriously than to live stained with such an abomination, spit it forth and came out of his own accord to the torment, as it behooved them to come that are resolute to stand out against such things as are not lawful for the love of life to be tasted. But they that had charged that kind of wicked feast for the old acquaintance they had with the man, taking him aside, besought him to bring flesh of his own provision, such as was lawful for him to use, as make as if he did eat the flesh taken from the sacrifice commanded by the king, that in doing so he might be delivered from death. And for, their, and for the old friendship with them, find favor. But he began to consider it discreetly, and as became his age and the excellency of his ancient years and the honor of his gray head whereon was come and his most honest education from a child, or rather the holy law made and given by God, therefore he answered accordingly and willed them straightways to send him to the grave. So let's go to 26. For though, for though for the present time I shall be delivered from the punishment of men, yet I shall not escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. Wherefore now, manfully changing this time, I will show myself such as one as mine age require, and leave a notable example to such as be young to die, willingly and courageously, for the honorable and holy laws. And when he had said these words, immediately he went up to the torment that they led him changing the goodwill will bear him a little before into hatred because the foresaid speeches proceeded as they thought from a desperate mind. But when he was ready to die with stripes, he groaned and said, it is manifest unto the Lord that hath the holy knowledge that whereas I might have been delivered from death, I now endure sore pains in body by being beaten. But in soul, I am well considered well, I am well content to suffer these things because I fear him. And thus this man died, leaving his death for an example of a noble of a noble courage and a memorial of virtue, not only unto young men, but to all of his nations. So we have it there. Once again, the mark of the beast. Uh, we have someone refusing 
to do the mark of the beast so they get killed. And then uh, 2 Maccabees 7, 1 and 2, and it came to pass that seven brethren with their mother were taken and compelled by the king against the law to taste swine's flesh and were tormented with the scourges and whips. But one of them that spake first said thus, What wouldst thou ask or learn of us? We are ready to die rather than to, than, rather than to transgress the laws of our father. So you got the mark of the beast there. Third Maccabees 2, and I'm going through these real fast. Third Maccabees 2, 25 through 33. He proceeded to Egypt, grew worse in wickedness through the, his for, before mentioned companions in wine, who were lost to all goodness, and not satisfied with countless acts of impiety. His audacity so increased that he raised evil reports, and many of his friends watching his purposely watching his purpose attentively join in furthering his will. His purpose was to indict a public stigma upon our race. Wherefore he erected a pillar at the tower porch and caused the following inscription to be engraved upon it. That entrance to their own temple was to be refused to all those who would not sacrifice. That all the Jews were to be registered among the common people, that those who resisted were to be forcibly seized and put to death, that those who were thus registered were to be marked on their persons by the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysius and to be set apart with these limited rights. To do away with the appearance of hating them all, he had it written underneath that if any of them should elect to enter the community of those initiated in the rites, these should have no equal rights with the Alexandrians. Some of those who were over the city, therefore abhorring any reproach to the city of piety, unhastily gave in to the king and expected to derive some great honor for a future connection with him. A nobler spirit, however, prompted the majority to cling to their religious ob uh, observances, and by paying money that they might live unmolested, these sought to escape the registration. Cheerfully looking forward to future aid, they abhorred their own apostates, considering them to be national foes, and debarring them from the common usage of social intercourse. So we actually have there in Third Maccabees dealing with the Alexandrian, those in Alexandria, Egypt, that it was given in them a mark on actually on them of Dionysius, it was a, a leaf symbol, and it was a stamped on them for them to do away with their practices. And if they would not, they was going to be excommunicated by the government. But eventually, uh, that didn't go through. But that's another mark of the beast, right? So we have all these mark of, of the beast. So Revelation, uh, when John came around, it wasn't nothing new about this mark of the beast. So then you go to Matthew 22, 17 through 21. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought him a penny. And he said unto them, Who's this image and subscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So here we see that they had the image of the beast on their money. And with the image of the beast, Christ said, you give the beast the things that belong to the beast, and you give God the thing that belongs to God, which is a theme going on in the book of Revelation. So we have an instance of what the mark of the beast was around uh, in Revelation from Christ himself. And then you got John. Uh, yeah, I only got two more than uh, or three more and I'll be done. John 19.15. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The priest, the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So this would be the ones in the first century 
those that follow the chief priests and all them, these will be the ones that receive the mark of the beast and the people that followed God, followed Christ, they will be the ones that didn't receive the mark of the beast, no matter if it was in Jerusalem or uh, throughout the Roman provinces. So now, for the people who say, the book of Genesis, I mean, sorry, the book of Revelation was written under Emperor Domitian. So we didn't read all of the mark of the beast that occurred uh, during the Greek time, during the Roman, uh, first century Roman time. So if people want to say, oh, no, the book of Revelation was written during the time of the mission. Well, let's go to uh, another spot to show that even during the time of the mission, the mark of the beast was going on there too. So this is uh, the martyrdom of Polycarp. I'm just going to read uh, two and three. This is what they were trying to get Polycarp to do. He was supposed to be a Christian. Therefore, when he was brought forward to proconsul, asked him if he were Polycarp. And when he admitted it, uh, admitted it, he tried to persuade him to deny, saying, respect your age, and so forth as that ye are accustomed to say, swear by the genius of Caesar, repent, say, away with the atheists. But Polycarp, with a stern countenance, looked on all the crowd of lawless heathen in the arena, and waving his hand at them, he groaned and looked up to heaven and said, away with the atheists. But when the pro council pressed him and said, Take the oath, and I let you go. Revile Christ, Polycarp said. For eighty and six years have I been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. And how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? So under the rank of Domitian, we have them trying to tell the Christians to deny Christ and swear an oath to Caesar. This could be considered the mark of the beast also. And then we got uh, martyrdom of Ignatius. This will be the last one. This is going to be on page four. I'm just going to read chapter two. Ignatius is condemned by Trajan. So this is during Trajan. For Trajan, in the ninth year of his reign, being lifted up with pride after the victory he gained over the Scythians and Dacians and many other nations and I'm just reading this, ain't even showing it. Sorry about that, y'all. I got it. Uh, and many other nations, and thinking that the religious body of the Christians were yet wanted to complete the subject, subjugation of all things to himself, and thereupon threatening them with persecution, unless they should agree to worship demons, as did all the other nations thus compelled. All who were living godly lives either to sacrifice to idols or die. So they had to either sacrifice to the idols, worship demons, or die. This is another mark of the beast. What happened in the book of Revelation is not nothing new. It's not about no microchips or any of the other stuff. We can clearly see that throughout all of the history of the Jews, all the way up into the Christians, they were said to deny Christ deny the Father, deny the Most High, or die. The mark of the beast has been around. The book of Revelation isn't the first time, and it won't be the last. Wherefore, the noble soldier of Christ, Ignatius, being in fear of the church of the Antiochians, was in accordance with his own desire, brought forth before Trajan, who was at that time standing in Antioch, but was in haste, in haste to set forth against Armenia and the Parthians, and when he was set before the emperor Trajan, the prince said unto him, Who art thou, wicked wretch, who settest thyself to transgress our commands, and persuadest others to do so, so that thou shouldest miserably perish? Ignatius replied, No one ought to call Theophorus wicked, for all evil spirits have departed from the servants of God. But if, because I am an enemy to these spirits, 
ye call me wicked in respect to them, I quite agree with you. For as much as I have Christ, the King of Heaven, within me, I destroy all the devices of these evil spirits. Trajan answered, And who is this Theophilus? Ignatius replied, He who has Christ within his breast. Trajan said, Do we not then seem to you to have gods in our mind whose assistance we enjoy in fighting against our enemies? Ignatius answered, Thou art in error when thou callest the demons of the nations God. For there is one, but one God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are in them, and one Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, whose kingdom may I enjoy. Trajan said, Do you mean him who was crucified under Pontius Pilate? Ignatius replied, I mean him who crucified my sin with him who was the inventor of it and who was condemned and cast down all the deceit and malice of the devil under the feet of those who carry him in their heart. Trajan said, Dost thou then carry within thee him that was crucified? Ignatius replied, Truly so, for it is written, I would dwell in them and walk in them. When, Tra when Trajan pronounced sentence as follows, We command that Ignatius, who affirms that he carries about within him him that was crucified, be bound by soldiers and carried to the great city Rome, there be to be devoured by the beast for the gratification of the people. When the holy martyr heard this sentence, he cried out with joy, I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast vouchsafed, uh, vouchsafed to honor me with the perfect love towards thee, and thou hast made me to be bound with iron chains like thy apostle Paul. Having spoken thus, he then with delight claps the chains about him, and when he had first prayed for the church and commended it with tears to the Lord, he was hurried away by the savage cruelty of the soldiers like a distinguished ram, the leader of a godly flock, that he might be carried to Rome, there to furnish food for the bloodthirsty beast. And that's the end. So we have right there Ignatius. He refused to follow uh, the demons, the gods of the other nations, and he was put to death for it. The people who saved their life, they lost it. The people who lost their life, they saved it. So the mark of the beast was nothing new. Uh, the Antichrist and the beast, uh, first century, that would fit Nero more than it fit anybody else because he would have been considered Apollo, the Apollyon. He would have had the he would have been the bringer of the plagues, the locusts, uh, that that foreign nation army, and those that was under Nero because we find out eventually Vespasian picked up when Nero left off. And he actually, in his legion, he had uh, his soldiers actually have the uh, locust em uh, emblem on their seals, which would also represent an army of locusts coming against Jerusalem. So uh, there we have it. And uh, Vespasian was put in uh, power from Nero, if I got my history correct. Oh, okay. I didn't talk a lot. So I'm done. If anybody else got anything to say, this is the time. Please do so. And thank everyone for listening on. All right, y'all. Thank you all for listening in. This is Elvin Israel from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not. Uh, let me try to end it on a outro note. Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOSD. Assembly Sound Doctrine Channel. Assembly of Sound Doctrine. AOSD. RPK. Resurrection Box Kingdom. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Oh. Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine.
I'm a righteous kind. Break out of trouble, I'm keeping it subtle. Just me and my brothers and sisters, they love us. We're fixing the puzzle, the stress, and I come to the bunk and the struggle with us. It's because wanna read it, believe it. They should be back, see it, and need it like a kid back. Bridges and pieces like a kid cat. I can't ease it, I get seized. It's Hollywood, not Dollywood. Alpha love, the kingdom within. A O S K is for missing. On free K, let you get it again. It's a poly world, not Dolly world. I beloved, the kingdom within. A O S D is for nesting. On free K, let your journey begin. A O S D, 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 A O S D. A simple sound, doctor.